welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Madden America podcast. This is your host for today, Ayurthi Dhar, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Mount Mary University. In the spotlight today, we have with us the highly distinguished Dr. Vincenzo Di Nicola, who's an Italian Canadian child and adolescent psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Montreal. He co-directs a postgraduate course in psychiatry and the humanities, which is an incredibly unique combination. He has written about the importance of relationality and dialogue and therapy, about the social in psychiatry, and most recently about the deep crisis in the very being of psychiatry. He has received numerous awards, written multiple books and articles, too many to note here and honestly too many to count. So Dr. Vincenzo Di Nicola, welcome to Mad in America. Thank you so, so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm not a stranger to Mad in America, I'm happy to say. Uh, not only am I um, a reader uh, of it, I, I, I consult it fairly regularly because I find it very intriguing. And I frankly have discovered really interesting things that are going on in the field, not to mention how people feel about how my profession is doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm also happily, uh, Mad in America has been very kind in reviewing some of my work. Mm -hmm. um, very warmly, I must say. But there's a kind of interesting difference because the reviewers um, have stated some of my articles, some of my points of view, almost better than I could. I, I was very, very gratified. <laughs> However, the readers are not so gratified. I mean, they say, yeah, you know, these are nice things, but he's still a shrink. And I think that's a very, very interesting issue to engage. It's not my specialty. Mm -hmm. It's not something I've given a lot of thought to. But I do believe that my profession needs to answer those questions. I'm glad you say that. Yes, often the readers uh, tend to be harsh because often there are people who have been harmed in ways and uh, and they see things we as academics often don't. So, all right, uh, let's get into this. Let me ask you the first question. We'll talk a little about social psychiatry. So you have written kind of the manifesto on social psychiatry. What is social psychiatry? Sure. Um, let, let me say that today I would say that it's a very, very important part of my personal and professional identity. And, you know, it's a little bit like if, you ha if you're a musician, if you're an artist, um, if you have training and, and you've dedicated thousands of hours of your time training and then practicing something, whether it's in music, in the arts or, or any profession, of course, it becomes part of you. So what's become part of me is um, a way of looking at the world my, and myself in the world, of course. So I, I have spent my entire career looking at, as a child psychiatrist, looking at life and, and, and certainly the kids I see in their families through three lenses, you know, child development, if you wish, or person development, um, families and culture. I did train initially in social and transcultural psychiatry after I went into psychiatry because I trained at, at McGill University where there was a division. Um, uh, there were other people in the world doing social psychiatry, but the McGill group founded a whole division and they became very famous for that. And I trained with the generation of founders, you know, from the 50s and 60s. And my mentor was Raymond Prince, who was one of the founders of social and transcultural psychiatry. So that's really been one of my lenses all of my life and a great part of my career. I see social psychiatry as a bridge of, of between different domains of expertise, not necessarily privileging one or the other. And that is one of my major critiques of the history uh, and so the so-called growth of psychiatry that we always privilege one thing. You know, we, we declare revolutions and suddenly uh, this is the new thing and this is going to explain everything. Actually, we need a lot more synthesis. We need, we need to build a lot more bridges within ourselves. I mean, among ourselves, among our own theories and, and schools of thought. So social psychiatry can be a bridge uh, uh, between fields of expertise on one hand, but also in terms of how we imagine people between personal and social being. How does someone develop an identity? How do we develop a sense of community? How do we imagine belonging? So, so it's, a, it's a bridge. So since you were talking about context, and uh, let me ask you this, um, how have we otherwise traditionally uh, studied humans out of context? Can you, can you think of some examples in which 
in which we study people out of context and what are the repercussions and consequences of doing that for the person and for, and for us as a discipline. So only looking at behavior, you will take a disturbed child and you will say, well, how can we decrease, you know, anything from something as common and, and kind of superficial as a petulant child, you know, the terrible twos, all the way to autism, phobias, and so on. And these are significant problems. So behavior therapy cut its teeth criticizing and, and trying to get rid of the psychoanalytic approach. And so I say, well, look, it doesn't give results. Let's take care of kids in a different way. Let's see if that helps. And, and many studies show that it does help. You can decrease, you know, negative behaviors, you know, self, self-harm, um, you know, avoidant behavior, all kinds of things. The problem is that these things are not very satisfying on a subjective level. I would argue neither for the therapist nor for the patients or clients, sufferers, whatever you want to call them. So behavior therapy was useful. It it was in context in one sense because it was in the context of, well, what learning happened to bring the child to be fearful? But on the other hand, the salience of of a parental figure, you know, giving a reward or or being the source of, of trauma, for example, that was not taken into account. You know, I mean, is there a difference between a therapist doing it or a parent, they didn't ask questions. We didn't ask questions like that. And eventually I became very dissatisfied with that. Then I had my own personal experience where I had, I had this terrible snake phobia. You know, I would literally wake up in the morning and look under the bed to see if there was a snake there. And I was, in spite of the fact that I was in training in behavior therapy, I was smart enough to know, well, this has got to mean something. What, what, what's this about? Besides it being annoying. Um, so because I was in training, I, 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 signed up as a subject for the experiments that friends of mine were doing on snake phobias. So this is the 1970s in London. And um, so I, I knew the people that were doing it. And that's probably what gave me the courage to do it. Otherwise, I probably would never have signed up. And so at, in five sessions of what's called systematic desensitization, I was slowly exposed to a snake, which happened to be called Monty. And it was a python. I mean, and, and the guy that was running the experiment, Tony Buffery, had literally been with the people at Cambridge that eventually became, you know, the Monty Python Flying Circus. It, it was very funny. But, it, it, I mean, in retrospect, the, the idea of being with a snake was not funny at all to me. It was terrifying. I mean, between being in a room with a snake and, and jumping out a second-story window, at the time, I would have jumped out the second-story window. So it was a dis- disabling fear. Five sessions. Very slow exposure. Um, you know, the first time, you know, they bring in this huge cage, you know, it's covered. And and right away I noticed, I started thinking different. I said, oh, is there really a, a snake? And then I would ask, oh, I said, is, is there really a snake there? Or are you just kind of fooling me? So two minute exposure just to a cage at, at, at the other end of a long room covered. And then and then they would stop and they would relax me. And the theory does work. I mean, it did work. So even at the end of the first session, they had brought the cage closer and they took off the, the, the covering. And I was able to see this Python, like two meters long. I mean, very long. And in spite of my terrible fear, something different was happening already in my mind, probably in my brain. And that was a, a kind of curiosity. Well, what, what kind of thing is this? It looks slimy. Is it slimy? And I, I would ask these questions and I'm very talkative, if nothing else. So, Things are going on that right from the very first session that the theory and the therapy couldn't explain, it didn't address. My thoughts, my feelings, they weren't interested in that. They would listen to me, they were, they were kind, they were, they were my friends and my colleagues, but they were not interested in that and they didn't have answers to that. They didn't have answers to what a snake symbolically represents. They were interested in my learning history about what, whether I was exposed to snakes and so on. And they're were, they were interested in my avoidance and my reactions. And they were measuring me physiologically for respiration, heart rate, and the rest. They were very little interested, except as people. I mean, they were nice people. So long story short, I go to these five sessions. Five, after five sessions, you know, spaced out by a week at a time, I have, I'm touching the snake, this python. It, it's sometimes coiled around me. I'm, I'm touching it. And, and. I'm learning at a rate that's unbelievable. Like my brain, my mind, I'm taking in incredible information. So you're learning all this information, this new information, you know, at what it snakes on my life. And so, and so I calm down both in my emotions, my thoughts, and my behavior. Here's the thing. 
I wanted to understand. And they couldn't explain it. They could explain, you know, conditioning, you know, and I knew all that. And I read all the articles I could. And I was working with two of the world's experts on fears and phobias. Jack Rackman is a psychologist. And I was on the team. We called them firms in London with Isaac Marks, like mystery behavior therapy. And I believed it. I mean, it's true. I mean, the, the, the facts were there. The evidence was there. My own experience was there. But it was unsatisfying because I wanted to know, well, why do I have this darn thing? How come I'm afraid? How come, you know, I, I consider myself a rational, reasonable person. I don't have other, you know, odd manifestations or things that stop me from performing, doing things I like to do. Where did this come from? But that curiosity made me cross the river. In, 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 I was in south of the River Thames in London. I call it my voyage from the south to the north, south of the Thames and north of the Thames. Because north of the Thames, you have the Tavistock Clinic, mm -hmm. which is a clinic based on psychoanalysis. So I went, I went to the Tavistock. I, was, I happened to be taking a course there at, on, on death and dying. And I went from that and I asked some questions. And I decided to go into psychoanalytic therapy. And my therapist listened to the questions in ways that the people at the Institute of Psychiatry did not with great curiosity, with great respect. And I felt really understood even before finding any possible answers because the questions were validated. So it was a profound experience for me. You know, I have a slogan, you know, for every door you open, you also close another. So it opened the door to meaning, to, uh, to thinking about mind in ways that I had not been exposed to before. So it, it, it didn't completely close, but it kind of started closing the door on my confidence and my self-definition as a behavior therapist. And, and I just can't believe that it, it, it was kind of, it opened doors for me and it kind it was a, it was the beginning, even though it was in the middle of my training, of already leaving a limited model behind. So that that's my you know long-winded answer. If we only look at behavior, we we don't see the whole context. We see some of it. Then later came the cognitive revolution, first you know in academic psychology then in clinical psychology and psychiatry, and they, and they invented um, cognitive therapy. So Aaron Beck, or we, we called him Tim, Tim Beck, who, who just recently died at 100, was the um, psychiatrist that really changed a lot of things with, with cognitive therapy. So, so going from pure behavior, we added cognition, and then we add, and then other people were like, for example, Canada's Sue Johnson, who did emotionally focused, you know, couple and family therapy. I mean, we went from only looking at behavior and totally eschewing what's going on in the brain and the mind to adding cognition, to adding emotions. And of course, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic therapy persisted that all the time. And they were looking at the unconscious um, drives, um, what these things represent in the mind and how to mind them and how to make sense of them. So I would say that we went on this terrible journey exciting in some ways academically, intellectually, but terrible in human terms in the last hundred years, where we kind of denied or suppressed or, or just said they're not relevant. These very, you know, thinking, feelings, uh, thoughts, uh, fears to, 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 to each generation or you know, re-adding them, you know, reinserting humanity in, it, in its full complement of context. But along the way, we come up with other blind alleys, you know, neuroscience, you know, neuroscience is fascinating, but it's not psychiatry. Neuroscience is fascinating. Neurology is fascinating. All, you know, what's going on in the neurophysiology of the brain is very important, but, but it doesn't answer these other questions. So everything is useful, but we have to know what we're using them for. Right. So uh, when you talk about this experience that you had, where you felt heard and even just in the questions, right. And uh, that was far more, let's say, dialogical and relational. Is this, is this what you mean when you talk about, is this the beginning of slow psychiatry, which is a concept that you've talked about? And, and if it is, could you tell us something more? Like, what does slow psychiatry look like in practice, um, in life, in the clinic? So how would we be doing psychiatry differently if we were practicing, let's say, slow psychiatry? It's, it started in Rome. I mean, in, in 1986, uh, McDonald's wanted to open up a restaurant in one of the most uh, beautiful historic uh, sites of Rome, you know, the Spanish Stairs. And there was a, a spontaneous revolt against it. And a guy called Carlo Petrini, who's a, a kind of leftist journalist in Italy, kind of took up that cause, wrote about it, and created this incredible movement called the Slow Food Movement. 
and eventually became part of uh, the slow movement in general, including slow cities, slow science, and so on. So I, I after my philosophy training, in looking back at all, all my practice and everything that I learned, I started asking myself, well, why do we need to speed things up? Why do we even need to think about intervening? So what difference would it make if you did slow psychiatry? What would we do differently? Everything and nothing is my answer. Everything and nothing. In other words, you could just do the same things you do, which I do. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't throw out anything I do, including sometimes short-term therapy or brief therapy. But I'm very, very reflective about it. In other words, I don't automatically value that to speed things up is better. Let, let me give you a lovely anecdote from Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget was, at least when I was in training, and, and he's still considered a really great child psychologist or developmental psychologist. So he talked about the certain stages, which he observed in his own children, and he became very famous for. For example, the operational stage. The operational stage is the child operates on the world. So he's looking at the child observing, and he describes something that always struck me as very important. The idea of operating on the world. The child doesn't know how the world works. So the child picks up paper, crumples it, and is learning tension and compression. I mean, fabulous things. So Piaget was known for his very methodical, patient, uh, elaborate observations of his own children. Many other children created actual experiments, looking at uh, many, many children in, in great detail over time. And then people would, would go to train with him, and not just journalists, but I mean, all kinds of people. And they would say, but Professor Piaget, can we speed up? Can we speed up the process? Can we make children go faster? You know, you know I want my kid to, to, to write at three. I want my kid to draw, uh, you know, better or, or improve their motricity. You know, start learning piano like the Suzuki or the violin, like the Suzuki method at three and so on. And then he, after a while, he, he called this the American question. So he would stop and say, ah, the American question, you know, speed things up. Why, why do you want to speed up a child's development, for God's sake? Why not let the child enjoy being a child? I mean, that's, a, that's an embodiment of what I'm talking about. Why do we want to speed things up? Now, pra practically people say, well, the person's suffering. I mean, in my snake phobia, it's, not, it's stopping me from getting up out of bed and I have to look and make sure there's no snake, snake under my bed. Yes, you don't want to live that all your life. But the question becomes, okay, so you want to relieve suffering. You don't want people to sit with their suffering. But, and, and, and I value that. I really do. I mean, if you have pain, you want to relieve the pain. But at the same time, if you can't change the pain, if you can't get rid of the phobia, if you can't get rid of the voices in your head, can you help people not feel like they're crazy, not feel like there's something wrong with them, not feel like they're bad? not feel like they're some kind, of, some, some kind of deficient human being and help them learn to live with it even if that's all you can offer. And I would argue that's a lot. So if, if you say, well, you know, wh why is this happening to the Job question you know, from the Bible? You know, why is this happening to me? Well, we don't have answers to that, but we can listen to someone complain about the vicissitudes, the pain and the suffering of their life. We can help them find meaning. We, we, we don't give them meaning, but we can accompany them on their journey to find meaning. So I think that's meaningful. So the whole slow philosophy, slow psychiatry would mean you could do everything the same, just in a different pace, in a different way, or you could also discover new ways of being with other people. So do what you're doing, but do it more slowly, calmer, maybe with fewer words, more spaces, fewer of what, of what Michel Foucault called dispositive, you know, tools, apparatuses. Maybe we could listen to people more. You know, today in Montreal, a family doctor sees a person, if you're lucky, for 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. And there, a rule came out and said, one problem at a time, you know, but, but, but I have, you know, fleas and lice. No, I'm only going to talk about fleas. I mean, it's a joke, but I mean, it, it's not totally true. And, and, and they're well-meaning. Um, they feel overwhelmed and they're, they're, they're dealing with paperwork and stuff like that. But, but the point is, when you try to speed things up, people feel unheard, um, disqualified. So I understand reality. I live in the real world. So, but I also understand the need to alleviate pain. But again, many of the things we deal with in all of medicine, in, in all of life, we don't have fast, quick answers for. But the, the culture, the society, the world we're living in seems to privilege Quick fixes, you know? In French, they say truc, you know? Are there tips, are there, are there tricks you can teach me? And I say, well, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of experience. I can suggest things, 
but will it work for your kid? Will it work for you? Everything that I'm going to suggest is something that we you have to digest. We're going to have to work through. So that's what slow is about. So I'm not against anything we do. I'm just saying, let's think about its impact on people. So um, I trained at Harvard with a wonderful guy called Richard Molika in the Harvard program in refugee trauma, because that's been a big theme of my work. And he talks about the trauma story. It sounds so simple. But the truth is, someone who is suffering has a story to tell, and they need to tell it, but they need an audience. You know, in narrative therapy, they talk about recruiting an audience for the person's story. This is very, very important. So recruiting an audience means you have time, you have the patience, you have the capacity to learn to listen to someone's pain. And one of the things that I I would add to Malika's story about the trauma story is, I think, and even in the program, I saw this, even when I was a student working with him and the whole group, even, even with very experienced therapists, people move very quickly from trauma to transcendence. In other words, they listen to the story and they immediately reach for, how can this person, you know, get over their trauma? How can they transcend it? How can they found, you know, like, you know, my analyst, you know, talked about, you know, the shamanic journey, the meaning of, of your pain, of your symptom and so on. Yes, but I mean, first, let's have the capacity to sit with the person suffering, to experience it for 20 minutes or maybe an hour or maybe five hours and understand what it means to sit and endure such pain before reaching for endurance. Most people are just surviving. I think it's enough to listen to them and and help them find meaning for their pain and if possible, find ways out. But to immediately reach for transcendence is to disqualify, to not honor their story. That's really what slow thought um, as, as, as a project in philosophy and what slow therapy or slow psychiatry would be about, giving people a chance to tell their story. What I'm saying is that by listening to people's pain, by giving them time, that itself is a gift that we owe to each other as human beings, never mind as therapists. So um, when it comes to like um, the, the growth of literature around trauma, and that is one of my areas of research, so I understand that the, the importance of, you know, for example, um, being there with suffering, but there is often an implication that the only way to kind of be there is to verbalize it and to maybe repeatedly. And, and I come from a culture where that's not true. Both my grandparents were refugees of the India-Pakistan partition, and then my parents were refugees of the Kashmir conflict. So we had to like run and, you know, houses burned and all twice in different in, in a matter of few years. And um, the problem is, is often when people come in and try and intervene and it's, it's done in the specific way that number one, the only people who can hold your space or who you can speak with to feel better has to be professionals and it can't be just people around you because for our community and culture, that's been the case. We, we meet during weddings and funerals and we kind of talk about it in a grief way, not right in a traumatic memory kind of a way, you know, the the, the work of like uh, early this thing, the traumatogenic memory. So, but rather it's more of a grief and loss kind of a thing. And even then there is, there is a lot of laughter and people have a lot of heterogeneous experiences. Some of them are happy to be able to get out of Kashmir. Um, The fact that we were given a lot of resources really helped us. So, um, yeah, I really hear you when you talk about, you know, this this holding of space and witnessing that, as it's called in a lot of trauma literature, the problem is when we necessitate that 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 kind of witnessing has to be, you know, done in a way that pain has to be verbalized and there is no other way to kind of do it. And it has to be done with a professional. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, but but this is really important. Let's let's talk about this. This is this is too important to let go of because I mean, um, like you, I've really dedicated a you know, significant part of my life uh, as a person and, and as a professional to the question of trauma. I think I think I'm I I like your language about this and and I like your 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 personal family story about this. Uh, like in the sense that uh, I'm moved by it because I think that's absolutely right on. But let's be fair. I mean, be, be, the people that do this work are very aware of that. They're, they're, you know, it's it's a big world. There's a lot of people doing different things. There are people that are guilty of, of, of acting as if, I don't think they believe it, but acting as if only professionals can be there. I think they just feel duty bound to offer something. Now, let me tell you a quick story. 
there's there's a there's two people from France called Didier um, Fassin and uh, Richard Rechman. So Fassin and Rechman in France. They're both doctors. Uh, they're both anthropologists. One is a family doctor anthropologist, Didier Fassin, and Richard Richard Rechman is um, a, an anthropologist and psychiatrist. And they wrote a wonderful book. I mean, very important book called The Empire of Trauma. And they took they took one uh, example. There was a huge factory, a uh, chemical factory in Toulouse in France that exploded. And as a result of this explosion, yeah, I mean, a lot of people were hurt and there was an assumption that people would be traumatized. So, so you know, in, in, this is, I think, the 80s, maybe 90s. Um, I think probably 90s, actually. So people come in with entire SWAT teams of psychologists. Um, exactly what you're saying, you know, uh, people are necessarily traumatized. Uh, they need to be debriefed. Uh, so they criticize that very strongly. And, and I talk about that a lot. And I did my doctoral thesis in philosophy, but it was on trauma. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Of course, we understand this. We, we don't think that professionals are the only ones. The, the vast majority of human pain and suffering is addressed or not by the, the resources of the individual, the family, the community, the religion, um, the elders, and so on. And I think you're right. I think a lot of it goes on, sometimes very well, sometimes not, because there's shame, um, there's disqualification, there's invalidation. So what we try to do is be aware of that through medical anthropology, so cultural psychiatry, and so on and so on, to construct a way in which we don't let people fall through the cracks. But what what Fassin and Rechman are saying is, but we should not also impose on people. So people got fed up. So it's, you know, the citizen would be interviewed three and four times by different people. And some people would say, well, but, but I'm not traumatized. I'm fine. Like, let me be. So one of the problems with any institution is it develops a life of its own and a logic of its own. So because we have psychiatry, we must, you know, send out psychiatrists. You know, my son who's a lawyer says, dad, get to work. There's two or three people on the planet that don't have a label yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very funny and I think sadly true. In my lifetime, DSM-2, 1952, just before I was born, to DSM-5, 2013, we went from a little, I, I've got it here somewhere. I, I literally have, it. it's a little pamphlet like that, spiral bound, some 50 or so pages, large type, to DSM-5, which is a thousand pages in tiny type, trying to document every possible vicissitude. Now, it's not psychiatry alone that's responsible for that. You know, it's also the society for people to be paid for people to have certificates for school or for work or whatever, they ask a psychiatrist to give them a, a, an assessment. So I don't think we should impose categories on people and validate them as human beings or citizens or, or having special status based on what one person says about them, like a, a therapist or a psychologist or, or a psychiatrist. So I agree with those kinds of criticisms, but that doesn't mean that some of us aren't motivated to alleviate suffering. And I mean, we don't have to go out looking because I work in a public system and we have supposedly free, it's not free, we're paying for it with our taxes. We have easier access to care in Canada, for example, than the United States. I don't have to compete for patients. I don't have to you know, build up a business. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more than enough people at the door. So in Canada, we don't need um, you know, a thousand pages of DSM-5 mm -hmm. to, to justify what we do. I can just see that, I can just see people in the, and, and write nothing in their charts. I mean, eventually someone will, will complain I should write a diagnosis, but I don't have to justify it like they do in the United States. So the, the, the social logic and the administrative logic changes a lot how people practice. But going back to trauma, I think it's very, very important to not believe that no one owns trauma. The, the, you know, one of my contributions is I, I identified what I call two trauma communities. You're saying people use the word witnessing. A lot of the humanists, you know, historians, anthropologists, people in literature and so on, talk about trauma using apparently the same vocabularies, but the clinical trauma community wants to help people. Mm -hmm. There are actually people, what I call the cultural com trauma community, that not only are not moved by those claims, they're actually against them. They say, well, wait, I mean, just let, let you know, document their suffering and be witnesses and, and forget the clinical mandate. Well, I've dedicated my life to being a clinician. I understand that argument, 
and I won't impose it on people, but people do come and knock on the door and ask for alleviation of their suffering. Uh, your new be- book is about psychiatry and um, psychiatry in crisis, right? So the first thing that I would ask is, could you tell us something about what you mean by psychiatry in crisis? And what does this imply um, um, on ground for both practitioners and patients? Uh, how has this crisis impacted them in, in their lives? Well, I think that's a great question. I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, first of all, I need to say, I mean, if it's not obvious, I mean, I am a professor of psychiatry. I teach psychiatry. So the, so I started asking myself after doing my, I sort of took a, an aside, you know, first I, I, did, I did my kind of graduate work in trauma at Harvard with Richard Mulika, and I started thinking, and I was unsatisfied that, as I said to Richard, I learned a lot, but I don't understand a lot more. That's what propelled me into working in philosophy. And I love philosophy anyway. I just became dissatisfied. I mean, I had the courage because I had stepped out of the community. I, mean, I didn't stop practice. I, I just spent, you know, uh, time in, in Switzerland with this wonderful group uh, at the European Graduate School. And I learned a lot. And, and I just put it aside. So in sort of looking aside across from another place and another set of disciplines, at the practice, it just became very obvious to me that not only are patients, I know some people don't like that term, but I know people are suffering, not, and not only the public dissatisfied, but I think the psychiatrists themselves are very dissatisfied. And it shows up in funny ways. I mean, when I was young, people would still go to general meetings and 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 inform each other and have, have meetings where different perspectives are presented. That barely happens anymore. What happens is people go to very specialized meetings. They go to a neuroscience or neuropsychiatry research meeting. They go to, you know, I'm a member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Canadian Academy, or they go to family therapy meetings. Um, and, and to the extent there are general meetings at the American Psychiatric or the Canadian Psychiatric Associations, there's no confrontations. I think people have actually given up on having a consensus. There's a sort of consensus. But people kind of avoid having any confrontations. I mean, I actually miss the debates of my youth when, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists would, you know, would go at each other. Um, you would go to a case conference and the psychologists would stand up, the social workers stood up, you know, later there would be medical anthropologists and different psychiatrists of different stripes and, you know, and perspectives would, would say, well, you know, the way, the way I look at it. And I, I miss that because I think people were listening to each other. They don't even listen to each other anymore. So part of the crisis is, People are almost afraid to express the the dissatisfaction of of a a shared general theory of what we're doing in a general practice. This kind of what, you know, physics talks about the standard model. The standard model is based on certain explanations, you know, quantum physics, quantum theory, and so on. Uh, And the standard model in physics, you know, with with a capital S, capital M, um, is as much debated as accepted. The standard model of psychiatry in my generation in the Anglo-American world became the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, which was ridiculously successful. I mean, you can't go to any country where the medical students, you know, from Afghanistan to Zaire are not carrying around the translated version in their pockets. And they open that. And when they talk psychiatry, they mean the DSM. So very successful with terrible consequences, I believe. The other, the other part of the standard model was the biopsychosocial model. The, but as Alan Francis um, says, biopsychosocial became bio, bio, bio. Now, well-intentioned, good-hearted people and many practitioners would say, well, no, that's not true. It's not true about me. It's not true about my practice. But it is true about how money was given up. It is true about what was valued for academic promotion. It is true about how people got power. Uh, and space in their departments, you know, for their particular line of research or even clinical practice. When I was a kid, psychiatry meant clinical psychiatry. And the researchers were seen as kind of nerds and eggheads. They may or may not have been. A lot of them were, by the way. A lot of them really were uh, number crunchers, you know. It's very hard to have all the human qualities, um, you know, to be a, a total uh, investigator, researcher, clinician. So people kind of, you know, spread themselves out in areas they're comfortable with. But what was valued? was being a fine clinician um, that, that had integrated a lot and could listen to people and, 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 and gave a degree of satisfaction, at least. 
well, that, that's not valued anymore. I mean, you're not, it's very hard to get promotion to be a full professor today or any kind of promotion, uh, any kind of status really in a hospital within you know, the institutional psychiatric world if you don't do certain kinds of research in a certain kind of way. Um, I'm not against that research. I've done it myself. I've done psychopharmacology studies. I've done research, psychosocial research. I did a PhD on psychiatric epidemiology. They're all valuable, but none of them should own psychiatry. I think clinical psychiatry should be clinical psychiatry. Academic psychology is fascinating. I have very good friends in that field, like my, my dear friend, Steve Picker, who is one of the most brilliant psychologists ever. Um, but that's not clinical psychology. So clinical, you know, my wife is a clinical psychologist. And, you know, Steve and Leticia have very little to say to each other. They're different domains, and I respect that. But I think psychiatry, psychology, for those of us who pretend to help other people, needs to be, have its feet firmly uh, based in the clinic. So th the crisis of psychiatry is that we don't have a shared consensual model. And, 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 and there's a sense of disquiet. People are listening to their patients, you know? I mean, people talk about side effects, and I'm very aware of that, and, and I'm worried about it, you know? Um, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. But let me speak to the, the in-house problems of psychiatry. So we have three critical gaps. We don't have a psychology, by which I mean a theory of people. How do people function? Like, like you know, I said before at the beginning, you know, we can't imagine man or humanity in the state of nature. So how do we imagine? What is the psychology of psychiatry? Well, it's not that we don't have one. It's that we have many. So there's a psychology associated with behavior therapy. There's a psychology from Tim Beck associated with cognitive therapy. There's an implicit psychology even in psychopharmacology. And there's a definite psychology in neuroscience, right? It's based on evolutionary psychology, as Steve Pinker would have it. And genetics, as, as many of my friends and colleagues do research in. So, you know, it's become about genes and brains, you know, what Raymond Tallis in decries as neuromania and Darwinitis. Now, these things are valuable, but again, they, 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 to some extent, they lead to blind alleys. So we don't have a general psychology. So what, what is the practical implication of that? So instead of saying, well, let's take, you know, younger Vincenzo with his snake phobia. What is that about? So instead of that, we have a psychiatric diagnosis. He has a snake phobia. Now, that's not too bad. You know, if I, if I, I can say this in public, it's not shameful. People are not going to think I'm completely crazy or discredited as a psychiatrist because I had, had a phobia. But what if I said, well, actually, you know, I had a schizophrenic experience. I had a psychotic experience or I was delusional. I thought people were against Italians in, in London because of World War II. And you know, I mean, th these would be the rational explanations, but inside the, the, the experience might have been terror sense of paranoia. Oh my God, they're going to find out that I'm an Italian, that my grandfather was a fascist, they're going to come and arrest me. So if you listen to people who are having experiences like that, it would take a long time to, to discover the logic I'm just suggesting. So it's easy to continue to talk about a snake phobia, not so easy to talk about a delusion, paranoia, hearing voices. Are you saying the diagnosis can, not always, but can, if, if done in a really fast and quick way, kind of foreclose certain possibilities of, of dialogue? Absolutely. Okay. And, and it happens all the time. And, and they may not be the intention of the person, mm -hmm. but but e either because of, of the vagaries of the situation uh, or, or being going too fast or because words hurt, people feel disqualified, discredited, devalued. Um, it's very delicate. So we've learned to be careful in some experiences, but not all. And I'm suggesting, you know, like it, in my understanding, it's it's not very disqualifying to say you have a phobia. It's it's still rather difficult to tell people in public. I hear voices. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 that is a consequence of not having a psychology. Everything automatically becomes a pathology. So so not only do we not open space to listen to a person's experience and develop a narrative, listen to the narrative, or or help them develop a narrative if possible. Not only that, but we have a very diminished view. You know, so I like to I like to tell the anecdote when I was in training, never mind the patients, the residents would would pester each other with labels, you know, oh you're manic today, you're paranoid, you're projecting. I understand that there's a stage where you're trying things on and you're you're looking at yourself, but I mean these are adults. I mean many of them were in their 30s, I mean late 20s, 30s, and they didn't know better than to call someone crazy. I mean, not, not the patients, each other. If, if they don't respect themselves and each other, what can we expect them to think about other people? 
Now, I'm not saying I'm better. I, I, went, I went to the same things. But because I've been a psychologist already, and because I held these kind of vocabularies in, you know, in brackets, if you wish, or in quotes, I was kind of ironic about it. So, so that's, that's a very big problem, not having a psychology. The second problem is we don't have a theory of psychiatry. What we have are competing models of what should dominate psychopharmacology, the community mental health revolution, the psychopharmacology revolution. Now we're living in the neuroscience revolution after the decade of the brain. There's nothing wrong per se with any of these things. Each of them represent an advance. Each of them represent a new way of thinking. Each of them open doors. But as I said before, when you open some doors, you close others. And in the field of medicine and psychiatry, when we open one door, we suddenly forget about all the others. The psychopharmacologists, you know, decried family therapy. Um, people that people that are doing research in schizophrenia, like Robin Murray in London, later acknowledged that in his own department there were powerful models of family interactions, whether they were right or wrong. But there was serious research going on, and he kind of ignored it or dismissed it, just like perhaps the social psychiatry group dismissed the genetics and the biology of schizophrenia or the so-called schizophrenias. I still think they're heterogeneous group. So the problem in psychiatry is not that we don't have rich, uh, uh, promising models. It's that people come along and they want to dominate the field. So it's not that we don't have our theories, that we have too many theories, and as a result, we don't have a model. Now, from a scientific progress point of view, it's great to have rich debate and so on. But as I said, people are not talking to each other. They're not synthesizing information, and we don't have a consensual model. What's the impact of that? People are in their little corners, you know? So the third problem is we don't have a theory of change. We have descriptions of change. We have competing models, you know, uh, what's going on in the brain is neuroscience, what's going on in cognition with, with Tim Beck's theory of cognitive therapy, what's going on in the heart, if you wish, you know, in emotions with Sue Johnson. I mean, we have many rich and extremely promising th uh, therapies that are both sensible, uh, they speak to people, uh, actually, our, our patients and clients often warm up to them very much, but there's no integration. There's no synthesis. So we have these critical gaps that leads to a sense of dissatisfaction, not to mention, you know, what human beings do. They compete with each other. They disqualify each other. And I'm not talking about the patients. I'm talking about the psychiatrists. I mean, people, you know, jockey for power. They jockey for influence, mostly well-meaning. But the consequences are that we don't have uh, a united house. Again, from a scientific point of view, we don't need one. But from a, a professional point of view, from a point of view of, of giving clarity to people, it's a problem. So why is that a problem for the people? Well, in Montreal, depending on what child psychiatrist you see, you might get someone that prescribes medications in a responsible and useful way, or you might get someone that wants to do psychotherapy of different sorts. You might get someone that does cognitive therapy or cognitive behavior therapy, or this new thing called dialectical behavior therapy, which is very popular with certain kinds of relational problems in young people and young adults. Is it justifiable? It's rich from the point of view of offering a diverse you know, suite of, of options to people. It's rich. But for a given person knocking on the door and not knowing who's going to answer when they open the door, it's a bit of a puzzle. you know. I saw a young girl recently that has a, a pretty clear and strong version of obsessive compulsive disorder. So I asked for a psychological assessment and therapy, uh, be, you know, that would be behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy, because that's what the data and the clinical experience shows. The, th the person that does that sort of therapy, who's very competent, is going to be leaving on sick leave. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, what about psychotherapy? I said, I think the world of psychotherapy, as you know, but... The, the data and the clinical experience suggest that if you want alleviation of the symptoms in a very reasonable amount of time, it's much more effective to use this form of therapy than another. So even within a service, you have these dilemmas. So, so some people's answer would be, well, we'll just go with the evidence base. The problem is we don't have enough evidence to resolve all their clinical problems. So those are the three critical gaps. We don't have a psychology and understanding of persons. We don't have a sensual theory of psychiatry. And we don't have a theory of change. And that does lead to confusion, competition. Um, and it, it would take a very well-informed consumer, if you want to use that word, 
um, a consumer attitude of, you know, of, of doing research, going online, uh, asking people's opinions to make an informed choice. Is that desirable? Would it be better to have a uniform uh, model and post? They did that in the National Health Service in England, where you go for that kind of problem, you will get cognitive behavior therapy because that's what the government says or the ministry says you're going to do. I'm also not very comfortable with that because it, it decreases uh, freedom, uh, a sense of choice, and so on. So there are not easy answers to this, but those are our gaps. This is why I think psychiatrists in crisis that I get resistance. This was a long project. This project started in 2013 in a dialogue with a co colleague of mine that's so different from me. He's younger. He's from Bulgaria. He's a psychiatrist, yes, but he's also a researcher in neuroscience. And, and, and like me, he's also a philosopher. So, but from, from very different starting points, we ended up with very similar, a similar kind of disquiet about where psychiatry is and where it's heading. So, you know, we, we went to conferences, we started talking, we made presentations. And as I say in, in, in the introduction of preface to the book, I got three kinds of answers from psychiatrists. So I said, I said, you know, I'm writing a book called Psychiatry in Crisis. And one, a senior psychiatrist, a very influential senior psychiatrist, says, psychiatry has always been in crisis, you know, since for 200 years. I mean, if it was founded on a crisis uh, and, and every generation has seen, which is true, by the way. Another, another person said, who's a very famous family therapist in the United States, a senior person is a person of distinction, um, has many, many of the qualities I would wish for in slow psychiatry. And so he says, so what crisis? And I don't know if he was asking for clarification or he was just denying that we're in crisis. This is a guy that's basically opted out of psychiatry. So I think, I think for him, the crisis isn't there because he's effectively opted for a practice that doesn't confront these uh, conundrums or, or, or problems anymore. Um, and, then, and then most people were in between sort of, sort of saying, well, you know, we have problems, but, uh, you know, we need to adapt. Uh, so, so the average person is, I think, in the middle. The average person is saying, there's a crisis. I don't know what the next answer will be. And because of the polarization, especially in North America, people are turning off to these, you know, um, single message uh, mythologies, as a German psychiatrist and historian called them. You know, I mean, you know, I have the answer. It's going to be cognitive behavior therapy. I have the answer. It's going to be social psychiatry. I do not pretend to have the answer, by the way. All I'm saying is let's round out uh, our, our, our practice by, by creating context and understanding what is social. All right. So before we end, uh, are there any last statements or something important that you would like to end with? Yeah. In psychiatry, we give ourselves permission, or another way to put it, it was arrogant enough to believe we can get to the bottom of human experience through ontology, which means the very way we construct being or the way we are in the world. And there are many, many ways we can go at that. You, you mentioned one of them, you know, Edmund uh, Husserl's phenomenology and, and the whole century of, of thinking that he produced. But the problem is convincing people that those are the right questions and that the, the questions of psychiatry will be answered by looking at being, understanding human beings as they are, not as, as, as the way they talk or the way we understand them. Um, th that's the real question. I'm a little bit optimistic in the sense that I think that people are finally coming around. I think they're saying that DSM is an asymptote. It has value, but it's the same as translating questionnaires to other cultures. It, it, it's, it is what it is, and it's got the limits it has. Getting to the heart of what people experience on their terms is a very different beast than taking Western ideas, however powerful, however, however valuable, and, and exporting them around the world as, as you know, waters uh, complained about Ethan Waters in his book, Crazy Like Us. I, I personally am not interested in exporting on what we do around the world. I'm, I'm genuinely curious about how Indians, Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, and, and even maybe in a local village experience the world. Does that mean that we'll never have the very thing I'm looking for, a consensual uh, psychology or psychiatry or psychotherapy? Maybe, so be it. But I would prefer for things to be valid Mm -hmm. In other words, speaking to the real human experience, something authentic, let's say, that something is reliable, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer rather than grasp for reliability, which is our strength in our technocratic world, I would rather try to, to change a little bit the focus. This is what slow psychiatry is about. This is what my investigations in trauma have been about. Everything I've done 
to try to get at the something that's more grounded, more fundamental, more authentic to people's experiences. And there are traps there too. It could also be arrogant. It could also be an attempt to impose uh, understanding, but it feels more human and it feels closer to what people are looking for. Okay. Thank you so much again. I really enjoy this. Are you the... Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.